So here's why I'm smiling. The Zoo Dirty Weekend 6, the DW6, is in the house. And I am thrilled that it's here. <laughs> I love Zoo. I've been reviewing speaker, Zoo speakers since 2007. The company was founded in the year 2000 in Ogden, Utah, where they still are, and they still design and build all of their speakers there with, I think, 95% US content. All the parts inside, almost the entire thing is sourced from US companies, and they are very proud of that. I know that doesn't matter to everybody, but for the people it matters to, there's that bit of information. So the DW6 looks a lot like last year's model. There's no denying that fact but it's actually pretty darn different. Though it looks the same, the cabinet construction techniques are very, very different. The base loading, the internal base loading of the cabinet is different. The driver matching, the left to right driver matching is a much higher tolerances in the new model. The internal wiring is a much better quality. The network on the tweeter is, is also improved quality. So it really is pretty gigantic differences from what came before. Now, I didn't hear last year's model, so I can't comment about how it sounds any different or better. Although I will mention that I did review the Zoo Soul 6 November last year, and I liked that speaker, but it put me through, a, I had to jump through a lot of hoops to get it to sound as good as it did. And this one, the DW6, and that was a much more expensive speaker. The DW6, I just plopped it in position and I was good to go. I mean, it took almost no tweaking to bring out the best out of this speaker. You know, it's funny, if you don't know Zoo speakers and you look at this speaker, you think, hey, it's a two-way speaker. Well, not exactly, because that big driver is a 10-inch full-range driver, meaning it does all the way down to the bottom of the base, and up to 12K, and that counts for a lot. And because it works that way, there's no crossover network in front of that driver. In other words, between your amplifier and the voice coil of the 10-inch driver, there's nothing. There's no inductors or capacitors or resistors there, just a direct connection from amplifier to that 10-inch driver. And that makes for, among many other things, a very immediate connected sound. You really connect with the sound of the speaker. Oh, and the titanium tweeter is set in a deep waveguide. Oh, I have to bring up two specifications for you guys. Number one, impedance. The DW6 impedance is on the high side. It is 12 ohms. It's higher than the average 8 ohm or 4 ohm speaker. So now you know. And the other number, that is, I think, even more significant is the sensitivity spec, which is 95 dB. That is a good deal higher than average, and the good part about that is that if you want, you can use the DW6 with very low power amplifiers. Well, how low? How about 2.3 watts per channel, like the Deckware Zen Trio that I hooked up. I use other amplifiers, but that one worked really, really well. But you can also use the DW6 with 100 watt amplifiers or 200 watt amplifiers. It's, it doesn't really care. <laughs> it just keeps going and going and going. I've mentioned this in other Zoo reviews, but a bunch of my friends own Zoo speakers. And some of these guys were the type that every year or so they get itchy and they get a new speaker, you know, always looking for a change. And I can't think of anybody who I know personally who got Zoo speakers who has since changed to another brand of speaker. That says a lot for, for you know, neurotic, crazy audiophiles to just land on a speaker and say, six, seven, eight years later, I'm good. I don't need to change anymore. That's impressive. Speaking of impressive, yes, there will be an audiophiliac viewer system of the day later on in today's show. And I also want to make a little detour here to just say that in my most recent video, just the one just before this, was all about people who listen loud and also listen quietly, but people who are hung up on, you know, monster amplifiers to play intensely loud music. And I love doing that video, but the comments for that video, <laughs> wow, there's about 400 comments. And I was really surprised and happy to see how many of you actually listen 
at very modest volume levels. Many of you at very, very quiet levels most of the time. You know, for all sorts of reasons, neighbors, family, blah, 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 the usual stuff. But you guys seem very satisfied listening very, very quietly. Now, sure, some of you listen crazy loud, you know, 100 plus dB loud. Yeah, that's good. And if you can get away with it and you're not killing your ears, go for the gusto. I'm all for it. But I'm... It's interesting, I have to keep this in mind when I'm doing these reviews, that most of you out there, so it seems, based on that sample of about 400 comments, that most of you are in the pretty moderate range of like 70 to 80 dB. That's sort of the happy zone for you guys, which is what it is for me, by the way, when I'm not doing the reviewer thing, when I'm just listening for pleasure. Yeah, I'm listening between 70 and 80 dB peaks, or low 80 dB peaks. So we're all on the same page is what I'm saying here. But anyway, if you haven't seen that video, please do. I will link to it below. The price, yes, let's do some numbers. The price is $1,599 a pair. As I said, it's made in Ogden, Utah. Now, my uh, review pair had the optional Superfly upgrade package, and that is $499 to the price. And what you get for your extra $499 is more options for finish, better left to right driver matching, uh, better internal wiring. There's a bunch of detail changes. All of that information is on their website. But the basic price is $1,599 a pair. I'm not I don't know whether the Superfly makes a big audible difference, I can't say, since I didn't do the comparison. The speaker is a mere 36 inches high. That's not very big, but it weighs 67 pounds. That's the actual, not the box, the shipping box. No, that's the actual weight of the speaker. 67 pounds for a speaker that's 36 inches high. It is solid, and you wrap your knuckles on this puppy, it is a very solid piece of uh, equipment, very, very much so. Now, when you look at the speaker panel by the inputs on it, you'll see two. You'll see normal binding posts and this other connector, which is called the speak on, I believe. And that's because Zoom makes uh, their own cables. They are also a cable company, and they make cables with that type of connector. And that's why it's there, in case, in case you were wondering. Now, also, when you're looking at the back of the speaker, you'll see there's a slot base port back there. So yeah, so that's kind of interesting, that slot base port, which may have some, some influence on why this speaker is so much warmer and fuller sounding than other Zoo speakers I've had come through this room. So uh, two other things to talk about. One is the speaker is sold direct by Zoo with a 60-day return policy. So you have 60 days at home to try out the speaker. And by the way, the speakers have 100 hours. This pair had 100 hours of break-in time on them before the speakers ship. For amplifiers, I used three different amplifiers over the course of this review. I used a very, very low-powered amplifier, the Deckware Zen Triode. 2.3 watts per channel. It's a $995 all tube amplifier, also US made. The next one was the first watt J2, solid state, 25 watts a channel into 8 ohms. And the third one was the MyTech Brooklyn amp, 250 watts a channel, because I wanted to play these speakers really loud and I wanted a really powerful amplifier, but I also were going to play them much more, you know, at moderate volume levels and I wanted to try those two much lower powered amps. My complete review system, all the gear used in the system, I will have that listed in the description below this video. Just before I started listening to the DW6, I was listening to the Klipsch Cornwall Force, a much bigger speaker, a three-way speaker with Horn mid-range and horn tweeter, $6,600 speaker. Got that locked in my head. I listen to it most every day. Pushed those out of the way and hooked up the DW6. And what did I hear? Well, it does sound like a smaller speaker, not surprisingly. But the thing that they, these two speakers have in common, the DW6 and the Cornwall, 
is they have life to them. They're extremely dynamic speakers. Subtle dynamic shifts, big explosive dynamic contrast. Both speakers do that very, very well. Yeah, if push comes to shove, as they say, yes, the corn, Cornwall is even more dynamically alive. But this speaker for, well, basically $15.99 a pair does so much of that. It sounds convincingly like a horn speaker in that sense of being dynamically alive. And both speakers, the DW6 and the Cornwall 4, play quiet really, really well. Again, getting back to <laughs> the reader survey about listening more and more quietly, these speakers can do that. And well, this is true for zoo speakers as far as I go back with them. But I think this one might do it even better. I just kept listening at late night levels, meaning in the 50 hertz, 50 hertz, the 50 dB level, and I was comfortable. I didn't have a, an urge to turn it up, to turn it up to hear more energy from the speakers. No, the speakers just have it. Zoo claims that these speakers can sound great from as close as two inches away from the wall. Um, but I didn't use them that way. Actually, I had them way out into the room, even with almost no toe-in, center focus was right on the money. Actual imaging overall was really, really precise. Because after all, you're essentially listening to a point source speaker because almost all the music, all the sound is coming from those 10 inch drivers well, up to about 12K. That's where the super tweeter kicks in from 12K up. So to my ears, it is operating as a, well, point source speaker. Or let's call it a semi point source speaker. I just made up a new category of speaker. Bass was surprisingly full. That fuller than any other Zoo speaker I've had here, certainly in a very long time. This is not a thin sounding speaker by any stretch. It's a very satisfying tonal balance. High treble was clear, clean, no fuss, no muss. Um, but it's the mid-range. The mid-range is where the magic happens with a lot of Zoo speakers, and certainly this one. Voices sounded, well, like human beings, like there was a body attached to the voice. Acoustic instruments, guitars, pianos, drums, they sounded right. For a music selection, I want to talk about something off the beaten track. This new recording by Sean Scheibe. He's a classical guitarist. The album is called Lost and Found. And it's all electric guitars, and it's all him. And it's just the variety of shapes and sounds and textures that he gets on the guitar. So one track, it sounds like he's playing an organ, and it's atmospheric, and it's beautiful, and it's dent, and it's dense, and it's sparse. It just goes from track to track. Every song, every track is a new surprise. I can't recommend this recording enough if you're into that sort of thing. It's an all instrumental recording. And if that gets your juices flowing, you could also check out his classical albums, starting with this, this one of Bach music, which is obviously just acoustic guitar. But again, his, uh, the, the, just that sense of fingers on strings and this beautiful tonality of his guitar, I gotta say, the DW6 was bringing the magic back home. But anyway, for the amplifier, I had been listening to the first watt J2, 25 watts a channel, and I decided to pull that out, pop in the deck where Zantrio 2.3 watts, play Sean's music again, and what did I hear? You know, it actually it held up really, really well because, I'll tell you right off the bat, this music isn't dynamic. It doesn't have pounding drums and big bass things. No, it's all mid-ranging music. And for that kind of music and for atmosphere and space, it was a very close contest in terms of hearing the beauty of his playing, of his attack, his rhythm, his pace, all those sorts of things. I would say I gave a slight nod to the J2, but there's something just so beautiful. So uh, as they used to say, lit from within about the sound of the deckware. So if you are one of those very quiet listeners, meaning, well, actually it does get loud. I'm gonna talk about that soon enough. But if you tend to listen at quieter levels and you're not looking for dynamic slam, yeah, the DW6 and the 2.3 watt per channel deckware can make really beautiful music together. 
So yeah, you know, this, uh, what I'm talking about here is for small rooms, by the way, using very low powered amplifiers. So keep that, keep that under, your, under your hat. So the next recording I played was this one, this Ray Charles record, which is an all instrumental record. I think it's all instrumental. And uh, it's so good. It is so Ray. It is so soulful and deep and just his feeling, even without vocals, just oozes out. It just comes out of the speakers. You feel like you're in the presence of an amazing musician and his band is so great and the charts are fantastic. It's a very uh, engaging listen and yeah, if you've only heard Ray Charles singing and you hear him in an instrumental setting, it's a whole different thing. So I'm still using both amplifiers, the first watt J2, 25 watts channel, and the Deckware 2.3 watts. Both are fantastic. Again, slightly leaning towards the J2, but I love, love, love the sound of the Deckware on these speakers. Next up is this incredibly beautiful music by Philip Miller. It's, it's a large ensemble for voices, strings, horns, and percussion. Lots of percussion. It is a very, very dynamic recording. Beautiful music, but very scary music at times. It's just got this uh, emotional impact. I'm not listening to the lyrics. I can't tell you what, it, what it's about. But it definitely puts me through some changes as I listen to this music. And I listen to it with the J2, first watch J2, 25 watts channel. And I also popped in the MyTech Brooklyn amp, 250 watts channel. And I'm playing the music loud, you know, 90 plus, 90 dB plus peaks. And here's the thing, I, I felt it, uh, the extra power made it play really loud with a bit greater ease but I felt that the J2 was a better sounding amplifier. One of the things that I loved about the sound of this recording, those voices, oh, those voices are, sound so good. The voices and the strings and the horns and the percussion, they actually sounded better with the J2. The next recording was purely electronic. No real instruments, no voices, just electronica. And it's by Alva Noto. And it's got these glitchy, sparkly electronic bursts, but on the bottom, this solid, solid bass. <laughs> Surprisingly, not played very loud. You don't need to play this music loud, and it doesn't have much dynamic range at all. But the low bass coming out of these speakers, even with the deckware amplifier, really set me back. I was surprised what these, this combo could actually develop in terms of oomph and power on the bottom end. I'm going to stop doing these comparisons with amplifiers because I think you get the gist of where I'm going. But that little amplifier for the right kind of buyer uh, who doesn't listen really loud, who isn't interested in impact, it's a, it's a very satisfying combination. But to me, the real winner in this contest of the three amplifiers was the first watt J2. Or any, I also tried a first watt F7. All the first watt amps are around 20 watts a channel would do great, really great work with the DW6. Yeah, all right, what about rock? Can the DW6 do the deed? Can it rock out? Well, yeah, <laughs> actually it can. I played Led Zeppelin. I played Queens of the Stone Age. I was into that kind of intensity. But really what I, what I was drawn to, because it's me, uh, I was playing Nirvana Unplugged. That's the one I really settled in with and turned it up to, I wouldn't call it realistically loud, and this is with the first watt J2. Not necessarily realistically loud, but pretty darn loud. 90 dB peaks. Um, and I was happy. This speaker can energize a room. Bass is surprisingly solid. That mid-range is, is beauty. The top end is good. I wouldn't call it the most transparent, the purest, or anything like that. But in terms of the entire packaging and that incredible imaging, that really, really focused imaging, it does soundstage depth really, really well. It's a hard speaker to uh, find fault with for the money and size that it is. <laughs> all right, with all that out of the way, we are now ready for... So Steve, what did you really think of the Zoo Dirty Weekend 6? You know what? I, 
I, I think I'm going to keep this one around at least for a while because every time I listened to it, I was just digging the sound. I, it, it actually kind of stopped me from being a critical reviewer and just disarmed me. I just wanted to listen for musical pleasure. That is one of the nicest things that I can say about anything I ever review is that I keep listening to it even when I don't need to anymore because I'm just digging the sound. And that was definitely the case with the Zoo Dirty Weekend 6. You've gotten to this point of the video. Thank you for watching this far into the show. And now, yes, it's finally time for the Audiophiliac Viewer System of the Day. This nice set of pictures comes from Floris. He's a huge fan of the channel. Thank you for sending them in. His speakers are Zingali Naples, and they are being driven by a Class A CAP 2100 amp. His digital source is an Oppo BDP95EU, and that in turn is feeding a Burson conductor DAC. For streaming, a Blue Sound No 2i. I have one of those. And for analog, well, for analog, we got this Microsecchi DQX 500 turntable that's fitted with an Audio Technica ET20 SLA moving magnet cartridge. The phono preamping is done by a PS Audio GHPH phono stage. For tube thrills, Floris is using a Yaquin, I think that's how you say it, MC10L tube amplifier. Nice going. Thank you for sending these in, Floris. All right, we are back. My name is Steve Guttenberg. Thank you so much for being here and watching this show. You know, every now and then I plug my interviews. I say, I got to tell you guys, I love doing interviews. I think there's so much great information in those interviews. I'll put up the playlist on top of wherever, I'll link to it below, of just interviews, nothing but interviews of audiophiles, of people who design stuff, who run companies. Um, I'm sure there's over 100 of them, maybe 150 interviews, and I am proud of each and every one of them. So please check them out. If you have yet to watch any of my interviews, give it a shot. If you dig, if you dig the show and you really want to help support the channel, the absolute best way to do that is to join my Patreon. A Patreon accepts payment in dollars, pounds, and euros. Just this morning, I was talking to one of my patrons in China. It's so great. I have a few guys in China that I talk to. And it's so great to hear their perspective on the audiophile universe, you know. So I get to be like a conduit for all you people out there. And I, it's a thrill for me through the viewer systems of the day and having these chats with my patrons. It's a lot of fun and I learn, it's one of those things, yeah, I learn just as much talking to them as the information I can give them. So yeah, it's a great thing about my job. And of course, if you just dig the show and just wanna like it, hit that like button and it really does make a difference to the YouTube algorithm and therefore to me. And of course, why not subscribe to the channel? And when you do hit the uh, notification bell, so you will be notified every freaking time there's a new episode, and there's going to be a new episode almost always two times a week. And with that, I can say thank you again for watching, and I hope, I really, really do hope to see you back here again very, very soon. Bye-bye.